Well, you know, Mike, I think you might need these because that, wow. Actually, I don't even think you need this because you can see the swirls on the back of that. It's pretty bad, huh? You know, but, the good news is the only bad part on this whole car is the top of the trunk lid. I've already done the rest of the car. But, I mean, <laughs> I'm always thinking is like this nice of a ride. I mean, come on, guys. Look at this car. This is an amazing ride. How do they let it get that bad? Well, the, uh, you know, that's a good question. It's just, you know, these things just get wiped down. And it always comes back to what I try to teach people. Inspect everything that touches the paint. Wash mitts, drying towels, wiping towels. Because if there's one sharp abrasive particle of anything inside your towel, and then you wipe the paint, you just put a scratch in. Yeah, and black's a full-time job. <laughs> yeah. yeah, black is not a color, it's a full-time full -time job. job. All right, well, once we get going here, uh, Mike has some really cool stuff to go over, and I'm really kind of trying to figure out why you have a pin in there, but I guess he'll explain that in a moment, so let me don't get too far ahead. Okay. Uh, let me do my little spiel, and if you haven't already, please like, share, and subscribe. It helps Dr. Beasley's out with the, all those little algorithms, so that way people see their content. <clears throat> Sorry, I have a frog in my throat, and uh, what do you call it? Like always, we appreciate each and every one of you that show up and watch these live detailing classes. We enjoy putting them on. We hope that you enjoy watching them as well. And like always, if you have ideas for any of these videos, what do they do, Mike? Uh, just shoot me an email or a message or put in the comments down below. Yeah, see, he's finally learning. <laughs> All right, so with that being said, I'm going to get over to that side, start moving some buttons around over there, and Mike, I guess, is going to be telling you about some polishers. So. Yeah, and just to recap, last week, we did something that, as far as I know, and I've been in the detailing industry since the 1970s. Um, Date we, yourself. We filmed live how to machine dry sand the plexiglass back window in a 1965 Corvette removable hardtop and buff it out like a piece of glass. I've never seen a video like that anywhere, but if you didn't catch that one, go up to the Dr. Beasley YouTube channel, look for a link that says live, click on that and you can find all our live classes. Okay, well, when Yancey came up here and started looking at the car, one of the things I was doing is this is the Harbor Freight version of the Porter Cable. Okay, so this is what's called a free spinning random orbital polisher. And one of the things I was doing is I was taking a Sharpie marker and I thought everybody knows this trick, but a lot of times I ask people if they know this trick and then they say, no, never heard of it. But I'm taking and I'm just putting a few black marks on this bright yellow backing plate. And the reason I'm doing this is so whenever you're buffing with a, what's called a free spinning random orbital polisher, the problem with these is when you turn them on, they can tend to stall out, you know, they'll, they'll stall out. They're, and the, what the black mark does is, if, without the black mark, when this thing's spinning or vibrating, it's just a yellow blur. But when you put a black mark on there, it's kind of like a timing light when you're timing the engine in a car. Your eyes can see if it's either rotating or if it's stalling out. So that's what the black mark does. Ooh, that's a good analogy, timing And you need light. to use it on any free spinning tool so you can monitor if the pad is rotating or not. And then if it's not rotating, then you can do some things to help it to rotate because Here's the fact. If you're trying to remove swirls, scratches, oxidation, water spots out of paint, a free spinning random orbital polisher is going to be more effective when it's both rotating and oscillating, not just doing one and not doing either, just jiggling. So anyway, that's why we marked the backing plate so our eyes can monitor it. Before now, you go on, do you know that that's like a big topic right now on YouTube is like, does a pad actually cut if it's moving or not? So we, that's a whole different yeah. topic, but I'm just... I, I have good friends that always tell me, well, the pad doesn't need to rotate or the pad doesn't need to oscillate and you can take swirls and scratch out. That may be true, but it's gonna take a lot longer. I'd rather see that pad doing both at a high speed, you know, pulling them swirls and scratches out. And the reason I mark this to show you this is because that's one of the benefits with the gear driven orbital polisher. You don't have to mark the backing plate it's gonna rotate and oscillate that pad no matter what. There's zero pad stalling, or as we like to say, all brawl, zero stall. Now, I've taken the liberty to go ahead and pull the backing plates off. And what we're talking about here, in case uh, you didn't see the headlines, this is, this is the Flex XC3401 VRG. It is an eight millimeter gear-driven orbital polisher. Recently, Harbor Freight, knocked it off. They brought out their copy and it's, it's, you know, it's not identical, but I mean, they did copy the handle, the housing. Well, they copied it. Everything. Everything's <laughs> a copy of it. And the difference is about a $300 
price point. But the other difference is, is of course, you get what you pay for in this world. If you have not learned that lesson in life, then someday you will. You get what you pay for. This is the Mercedes Benz of polishers. And this, I've used it on one car, it's held up so fine. My guess is this will never hold up as long as this. You put them in the same shop, the same type of torture that we detailers put these through. But at 100 bucks, if you're a weekend detailer, you're gonna buffet your car maybe once or twice a year, you're not gonna wear it out like a pro would in a production shop. So that's kind of the difference on the price point and the quality build. But I went ahead and I took these backing plates off because when we say right, gear driven, I wanna show you what I mean by the gear. Okay, so when you look inside here, you see a gear set. That's the outer gear, ring gear. And then here's the gear set on the backing plate. And this is for the flex, but the, the Harbor Freight is the same way. So they got pretty much the same copy of it. And these gears, this is what causes this to be what, what people call forced rotation and forced oscillation because of the gears. There's no slippage. There's no free spinning spindle with a counterweight like you have with this, okay? So uh, anyway, that's the difference. And then since I have it apart, I just wanted to share something with you. And Yancey was asking about this little uh, tack the reason I have this tack is because when you buy one of, either one of these tools brand new, um, you wanna take and get, this is just some air tool oil, but any light oil will work. And you just wanna put a few drops of this onto that felt ring, okay? And I'll show you why. And how often would they need to do that? You know, that? it depends. If you're a weekend warrior using this tool, you know, two or three times a year, probably once a year. If you're a production detailer, I'd say once a month. It doesn't hurt. Plus, it's a good idea to always check and make sure that bolt is tight. They can work themselves loose. So let me just go ahead and grab this one too. Now, um, Flex states that you don't have to do this. And I wrote an article about this probably 15 years ago. But here's what happens if you don't do it. If you start pushing down on this hard, this hard plastic will rub against this aluminum housing. And you, you guys that have used the Flex for years like me, you've seen this. You're buffing and you see these little black shards flying out onto the paint you're buffing. And that's this peeling up because it's abrading and it's not slipping against that aluminum. So put the oil on there once in a while. Now, Rather this- be safe than sorry. Oh yeah, and this is a wear part. So I always just use a tack. This is just a simple thumbtack. Then you can come in here and just kind of grab this and lift it up and pull it out and then periodically just flip it over and then re-oil it. And you wanna be careful when you're doing this. Here's the, here's the voice of experience. You don't wanna stretch this, okay? <laughs> Makes it hard to put back in. This is a very defined perimeter here. Anyway, so then just take and, uh, and of course you could probably lube it, like I could have lubed that while it was out. But uh, then just carefully place it back in there. That's what I mean by don't stretch it. Maybe you... No, it's going in. You just got to take your time and... Be gentle. Be, have a little finesse. Finesse. All right. Okay. Then you go ahead and if this was, uh, you're just slipping it over, then you'd want to put some oil. Do you want to hear something funny, Yancey? Funny. Okay. One time when I had a brand new Flex 3401, I didn't have any, you know, uh, Oil with me, just had zero. So I had a 1967. Oh, I uh, know where this is probably going. <laughs> I had a 1967, um, uh, what was it? A Lincoln Continental. Okay, so you know what an old school V8 has that a modern car gets kind of hard to find? Oil drips? Uh, has, a, has a dipstick for checking the oil. Okay, so I went over and pulled the dipstick out and squeezed all the oil off the dipstick and put it on the felt ring. The felt ring does not really care what kind of oil you use. One time when I was working on a car for my home, I needed to lube the felt ring. I went into the house and grabbed uh, my wife's olive oil. Just oh, you're in trouble now. Cooking oil, okay? Sorry, Stacy. Okay, then, then here's a couple key things too. This is so important. You, this, this is a very purpose-made um, screw. Okay, you don't want any longer and you don't want any shorter. And this is a very stout washer that comes with the flex. And there's a slot here on the spindle and you want it, and there's a slot here in the backing plate on both these tools. So you wanna make sure you line this up correctly and make sure it's flush and then go ahead and place in the washer and then the bolt and then go ahead and tighten it down. Now- um, And don't over tighten. Yeah, well, you want it snug, man, I tell you. Uh, but you don't wanna like yeah, be you gripping down 150 foot pounds of torque. <laughs> 
Yeah, you don't want to get to the point where you can't get it out of there. <laughs> so, one time someone brought me a rotary polisher with a backing plate cemented on to the. Um, you know what I saw the other day on Facebook? What's that? On Facebook Marketplace, there was a Flex 3401 with six pads for 200 bucks. Wow. That was a kill deal. I've never worn one out. I, I've I never had my original one from when they first came out. Yeah. Uh, now, the other thing I'd point out, and I, there's a review for this up on the um, Dr. Beasley's blog. But when I, uh, I made a video about this, one of the things I noticed was that their, their washer bowl system is subpar. Um, it's just undersized washer. It's got a cheesy little lock, ring, lock washer on there and a cheesy little bolt here. Um, if it's the same metric diameter, I would copy what the flex people did, put a bigger washer on there and a higher quality bolt. You know, that's up to you. Okay. And then this has a lock button. They both do right here to lock up the gear set. So you take and you push that in, put your wrench on here. And then as I spin this, it'll fall into place. The, the gear there will, there, there it is. locked in. Now I can, Tighten that. That is snug. Make sure this one is snug. Oh, they're not the same size? No, they're actually different sizes. That would have made it simple. Uh, that is snug. Alrighty then. Okay. Okay, I'm done with the wrenches, done with the oil, done with the tack. Okay, so now we've got these things reassembled and then just real quickly, if you want to just come in here and look, they both have a forward bell handle. They both have a recessed lock button. Um, this actually has what's called a tool rest. Okay, right okay. here and right here. This is soft rubber. And I know guys cringe when I do things like this, but that's so if you want to set it down on something, it won't just slide off. Flex actually doesn't have that. They got this hard plastic case here and just hard plastic here. I would never set this up down, upside down on the hood of a car. Um, then they say they got the soft start triggers, both of them. And let's see, they got, this has a... Uh, What's the difference in the motors? Um, I didn't memorize all that, so I don't know. I think they're both 8 amp, so okay. they have plenty of power. Uh, then variable speed dial, this one's placed on the top, goes from speed 1 to speed 6. This one's over here, is on the side. Um, trigger locks, you can lock your button in place, so you don't got to hold it the whole now, time. Now, does that one spin the same way as the Flex, it's not reverse like Malay? Nope, this is an exact copy, so they both been counterclockwise. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and uh, start these out on one and just let you his, hear the motors on these. So here's the Harbor Freight on speed one. Flex. That's the same. Now we'll bump all the way up to six. This is the speed I like to buff on. It okay. went to seven, he'd be on seven. Flex a little bit quieter. This sounds a little higher. It's a higher pitch, but the flex higher is pitch. actually quieter. And uh, this also, they actually did a good job. It has the ergonomic, very grippy rubber handle here with ribs in there, so it's easy to grip. Um, a 25 foot cord. Uh, here's the ports to change the electric plugs. Uh, flex actually doesn't have that. You oh, have the to brushes, you mean? Yeah, the brushes, yeah. You have to disassemble the body to get in there. And I think this comes with about an eight or nine foot cord. So. Uh, but for the most part, identical tools. Yeah. You're not going to tell the difference between one or the other. And of course, then kind of back to this. So with this black mark, when you turn this on, here I'll turn this on and buff on the table. See how it's easy to see if it's spinning with that black mark? And then also if it's not spinning, okay? That's called pad stalling. Anyway, um, with these gear driven tools, you do not have to mark the backing plate. Now, I want to show you a couple other things. Besides the original XC3401 VRG, AKA the Beast, uh, Flex also has um, two other tools that are Beast tools. This is the Supa, that's S U P A, the Supa Beast, and this is a lighter, quieter, cooler, smoother version of the original. Has a little less OPM, a little less RPM. That's what makes it smoother, lighter, quieter, and cooler. And, and they've covered up this aluminum um, housing here with a plastic case. This, the aluminum's still in there. A lot of people think it's gone. It's still there. It's just behind. Well, they did that as a safety thing. You don't burn yourself because it gets hot. They both get hot. 
And uh, then they re redesigned it to pull the air in through here and then flush it out through the, the backing place so it runs actually cooler. Uh, but that's called the Supa, Supa Beast. Then this, of course, is the Sea Beast. And the letter C stands for cordless. And I'm happy to say I named all three of these tools because I write about them a lot. In fact, I, I wrote a book. I just wanted to let you know that I'm, I'm a big fan of Flex Tools. Even at one time, if you're new to the detailing industry, this is out of print. But I actually wrote a, a, a tool specific to how to use the XC34 on VRG. And I'm not partial to any tool. I just use what works for me. I also wrote one for Bigfoot. This is also out of print. Um, I, but I still think they can get them by PDF. PDF, yeah, but yeah. you can't get the print versions. But you know what? They're so they're out of date. You know, well, they're so out you're of date. Out of date. No, just okay. Just... Now, one more thing before we go start buffing on the here that I want to show you is what eight millimeter looks like. So, so this is eight millimeter. Hold this, it up against your shirt. The Sea Beast, the 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 Sea Beast, the Super Beast, and the Original Beast are all eight millimeter. So let me show you what eight millimeter looks like. Okay. Hold it up against your shirt. So let me know. There you go. Can you see the inner perimeter and the outer perimeter? That space right there is eight millimeters. Now let me contrast that. I brought over the Flex Finisher, which is a 15 millimeter. Now look at that perimeter, see? Turn it up, there you go. So when someone talks about an eight millimeter, a 25 millimeter, a five millimeter, a nine millimeter, what they're talking about is the orbit stroke length. So it spins a pattern in a circle, it makes orbits, round circles around that orbit, and it's the diameter of those little orbits. It's the diameter of the lower orbits. That's what that, that's what that gap there is. Anyway, and then if I brought a 21 or a 25, you'd see a really huge, huge stroke on that thing. Okay, so that's kind of what I wanted to show about that stuff. Now, if you want to come over here, let me grab a scroll finder light because it, it does show well. I have detail. So this has got a custom base coat, clear coat paint job. I would, you know, when we talk about paint being soft, hard, or somewhere in between those two extremes, um, I would put this on the soft side of medium. I don't know if I'd call it medium. It's definitely not hard, but it's definitely not soft. I mean, soft paint to me is paint that you have to be careful just wiping you with the towel because the towel can scratch it. That is a pain to work on. That is soft paint. But this is just on the soft side of medium. Can you capture these swirls in here? Oh, yeah. Okay, then I've taken a crayon and I've actually marked out some deep, there's some deep scratchers running this way, there's some running this way, there's some running this way. And I just, I pointed those out for myself to make sure I pull those out when I need to finish this car out. <coughs> Excuse me, but also, a lot of times when you're using an orbital polisher, any brand, gear driven, free spinning, it's not gonna pull out what are called RIDs, random, isolated, deeper scratches. Um, and what'll happen is we're gonna buff out all the millions of shallow scratches and then the rids will remain and then they're gonna stand out like a sore thumb because there's nothing camouflaging them. So let's go ahead and because I've been working on this car and I already know it's gonna to take to polish this out, I'm gonna to go to a foam cutting pad. This is an SDO, it's a light foam cutting pad. Now we're um, just going over everything. I know the answer, but maybe some of those people out there now it's a good idea to always have your pad centered on this as well oh gosh yeah yes, yes. Oh, you know whatever tool you're using especially the rotaries but no matter what it is try to do your best to center it up i didn't get that perfect i'll show you my technique what i do is i take my thumb i hold the pad and then i bring my thumb and the backing plate together so now if i'm shaking at least i'm shaking in unison and then as i bring this down closer and closer i can kind of monitor where it's at and get it really really center it up it's just important and also as your backing plate you know a backing plate is a wear item the backing plate itself wears out but the hooks whether they're mushroom or j hooks or micro hooks they start to wear out over time and they quit holding the pad on um, and what will happen is you're buffing with one of these tools because they got so much power that pad will actually walk around with the backing plate and all of a sudden the, pad, the tool will sound like it's got a flat tire like this womp 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 starting to really jump around on you and if you stop and look you'll notice the backing plate and the pad are no longer centered so stop recentered or switch to a dry pad okay this is the dr beasley's nsp 150 and uh let me just a lot of people new to this uh live broadcast might not know what this is this is our version of a compound and the difference between this and anything else there's three pea sized drops is everything in here is organic nothing is or inorganic nothing's organic 
And in our system, after using any of our NSP primers, you can go right to the coating without doing a panel wipe because there's nothing organic in there to keep the coating from bonding. Okay. Are you ready? I was born ready. Okay. I'm going to turn this on a slow speed. There's four. Just to kind of spread this out. And here's a technique tip. You know, one of my good friends there, Dago, I saw a video, says, you don't got to do this. I like to do it because what happens is if you put your product on here and just put it down, all the product because of the weight goes into the foam. So I like to spread it around a little bit. And when you come up next to a little dauber of product, don't run the edge into it. Lift the pad, keep it in contact with the paint, and grab it. Spread it around. Grab it. Spread it around. Grab it. We're done. Don't be the guy that does this. On the edge okay, now I'm going to spin my product out. Okay, now I've got a nice uniform layer of abrasive technology. Here's center of the hood, because here's the trim piece that shows where center is. Now I'm going to make, I'm just going to go ahead and make eight section passes. Listen to the tool, watch the tool, we'll wipe off and inspect the results. a book on detailing cars that got like seven to my name so I know a little bit about uh, heat and um, yeah you don't want to get the paint super hot but look buffing it's gonna get it warm <laughs> okay so let's take check this out but the thing about a gear driven tool is you can push down and here's what that does it engages the abrasives with the paint and causes them to take little bites out so for me a lot of people know my detailing styles I want to go as fast as I can to keep my quality high and if I can push on that polisher and push those abrasives in, it's going to abrade or level that paint faster than holding a tool there lightly and just letting it kind of flop around in the paint. So, okay, Yancey, if you can come in and check this out. I'm seeing, give me the light. Yeah. Okay. So now, eight section passes uh, on this incredibly trash paint. It, it, look, it let removed, me see the light. It removed everything but most of the reds. Before... Well, I, I can't reach because I'm going to lose the camera here. Like, <laughs> Let me, yeah. I just don't know where you need it. Bring it up, up that right. way. There you go. Okay. Closer. Now go across. And there we go. So a huge difference. That's just the first step. But these deeper rids are still there. And there's a couple of ways you can attack those rids. Me, once I polish out this trunk lid, I'm taking a wool pad and a rotary to the rids. Then I'll come back with the same process I used to pull the holograms out. Okay, <clears throat> you could just add some more product to keep massaging it with a orbital polisher, but you know, rids are, are random isolated, the keyword deeper, they're deeper scratches. So it'd probably just be faster to take them out with the rotary. Now something else before I switch over there and show the um, flex, one of the things I like about a gear driven tool 
is look back here. What would you say? Is that two inches? Not two oh, inches? Oh, yeah. Two and a half? <clears throat> okay, well, the free spinning tool, if you go up on edge and try to buff out that thin panel, the pad's going to stall out. You're not going to do anything. So let me show you the technique I teach in my classes. I'm going to put some product down here. Now watch this. What I want to do is I want to lubricate the edge of the pad because I'm going to go up on edge and I'm going to knock this panel out. And here's the benefit to this. Instead of setting this down and going getting a, different, a smaller tool, the smaller pad to do this part, I'm going to do the whole car with the tool that's in my hand. And, and a lot of people say, Mike, how do you get cars knocked out so fast? Well, I'm not screwing around changing tools and changing pads. I'm taking the tool that I got and I'm making it dance on paint. Now watch this. I need product on the edge here because I'm going to go up on edge. Now I could do this, take some product and massage it in, but I'm too hey, lazy for that. So I'm going to do this instead. Turn the screw down. I'm just going to walk this in slowly. I'm going to make the tool prime itself. Boom. Look Ready at you. You're so smart. Okay. Now watch how I do this. Usually what I do is I'm going to go up on edge one way. And this way I'm going to turn it, uh, I'm going to tilt it. For me it would be clockwise. And I'm going to knock out basically this portion about the inch away from this chrome trim. Then I'm going to tilt it this way. I'm going to knock out this part right here next to the edge. And then I'm going to come back <coughs> at another angle and kind of schmoo the two, two paths I made over so there's no marring from this heavy cutting pad. So watch. And notice how I don't have my hand up on the handle. And the reason for that is because I want to see what that pad's doing. So I don't want my arm or my hand in the way. But notice how I got, there's speed five right there. No pad stalling. Okay, now I'm going to come this way. I'm going to make that thing trail right next to that edge. The guy that owns this car, he wants to take it to a car show. He wants every square inch squirrel free. Okay, so now I've done this section, this section. Now I'm going to come back. And I'm just going to angle this thing like that. So now I'm going right down the middle. Boom. And that's how I turn a six and a half inch pad into a two inch pad, get the job done so I can move on to the next panel. Um, here's another technique. Now that I've been working with Dr. Beasley's products for a, a lot, uh, like that Dino Ferrari back there just got buffed out with Dr. Beasley's. <coughs> um, you're going to get a buildup of product, just like with any product on any pad. And what I like is a good clean tire detailing brush. And I can just come down here and look at it. Just getting that excess off before I start adding fresh products. So if you're a Dr. Beasley's fan, there's a tip for you. Get a tire cleaning brush. You know, you can do it while it's running, but it actually works just as good just to do it when it's dead stop. That's how I, I clean my pads in between sections on a panel. Okay, so let me wipe this off. We'll jump over there and we will check out the... And of course, I'm going to come back and hit this with the NSP 45 and a foam finishing pad and perfect this paint before I put a shroud coating on it. Okay, so over here I've already got a flex all powered up. I'm going to put the exact same pad on, centering it. These are Lake Country. This is actually an HDO. The only thing I don't like about the HDO is it's got this stiffer gray portion here. I don't like to go up on edge. I might dig that into the paint. So I like the SDO for that reason. Okay, NSP 150. These come in eight ounce and 32 ounce bags. But you can order the Dr. Beasley 14 ounce squeeze bottles and pour them off. It makes, it makes everything about buffing out a car quicker, faster, and easier having squeeze bottles. Cord over shoulder, standard protocol. Dab, 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 re-dab. Okay, now I'm gonna press it. And again, when I come up to it, I'm gonna tilt and grab that product and sandwich it between the paint and the pad. Yeah, spread my product out. Okay, 
Okay, that's not really buffing, that's just spreading the product out, but I have a uniform layer of two things, abrasive technology and lubrication. You need both to create beauty. Now I'm gonna do eight uh, standard section passes. Real quick on eight section, I know my good friends in the industry teach doing short cycling, and that is important and it's really good for factory thin paint, but this ain't no factory thin paint job. This is a custom paint job. I got a lot of paint to work with there and it's in bad shape. So I'm gonna just make eight section passes. I already know from buffing out the rest of the car, it's gonna only pull out most of the stuff. I still gotta come back and pull up the rids. So I could probably go to 10 or, or 14 if I wanted to. But again, I'm not working on thin factory paint. I'm working on thick custom paint. <laughs> Seven. I want to point out two things. This next pass, I'm going to bring my pressure up because polishing paint is an art form. It, we bring the human elements of care and passion. It's not a grinding process. Step one, step two, step three. Um, but the other thing is, is look how big of an area I'm tackling, Yancey. Yeah, I know you've tackled. It's freaking them. huge. Yep. Okay. All these other polishers out there, you know, you got to work a little tiny section. It take you forever to do this with a eight millimeter gear driven beast. I mean, you can, the reason I can buff out cars faster than a lot of people is because I can tackle bigger sections because I can push on this, engage the braces with the paint, remove the defects, level the surface, and move on to the next step, not waste time. Last pass. Left, left, left. You got a light over there? I do have a light over here. And I'll tell you, this side wasn't as bad as that side, so I can already tell it looks better. Now, again, I said at the beginning that this is on the soft side of medium, so it will take another step to perfect it, but I think you'll be able to get the idea here. There's eight section passes with the beast. That, you catching mm -hmm. that? Okay. Okay, very, very little marring, and most of that is from the pad. Pads yeah. have a sharpness to them. Yeah, you're going a compound, so you still have one more step. Yeah, so, okay. Anyway, um, all I'm going to do after this is I'm going to take and repolish that using some NSP uh, 45, which I don't have over here with a softer foam polishing pad, and then I'm going to go ahead and coat this thing. Anyway, that's what I got for you, Yancey. <laughs> all right. Let's see if anybody's got any questions about the beast versus the Harbor Freight forced rotation orbital polisher. You know, I see a lot of people calling this thing the Hercules. It says Hercules right on it, but if you go to Harbor Freight, there's a lot of tools called the Hercules. It's a subcategory of one of their lines, just like this is called the Braun. So what that is? Oh, Bauer. This is the Bauer, okay? So um, they have their own little internal naming protocols and 
Um, they actually should have gave this a name, you know, but they didn't. They just called it the Force Rotation Dual Action Polisher. <laughs> they just went easy. Well, I, I've been actually working with tool companies for, I don't know, 15 years, maybe longer. And um, I, I have sent multiple emails to the engineers saying, hey, when you get ready to launch this, and this includes any, any tool company you can name. And I said, do yourself a favor, you know, give it a nickname. Like, Rupes calls their tools the Bigfoot, you know, and uh, I named the Flex Tools the Beast, the Super Beast. Someone else named this the Finisher. wasn't me, but it, was, it has a name. It's called the Finisher. And um, I remember when Makita launched the PO5000C, um, I did all the um, prototype testing for that tool. A lot of, there's 25 guys that came down to the garage and had to sign a non-disclosure to test the prototype out. Two Japanese engineers flew here from Japan to go over the whole thing. And um, I said to him, I go, when you guys launch this, give it, give it, call it the Falcon. You know, give it a cool name. Nope, the it's the PO5000C. I, nobody's going to call it by that name except for me, and that's because I type about it, so it's easy to rattle off the full part number. All right. Okay. All right, catch your breath. Okay, it's me, the voice from the nether. I'm going to be answering your guys' questions right over here on my laptop. So if you have any questions, get them in. We got about 20 minutes to go through all these questions. So let me flip it back over to his oh. mug. Uh, all right, we got, oh, wow. Somebody beat somebody today. Uh, we have Tim coming in first, ready to roll. <laughs> somebody beat. Puerto Rico, first yep. from Puerto Rico. Yep. There he is, though. He's ready to roll. Today, he did not live up to his name. I, that's the first time I've ever seen him not be first. I know. That's me, too. I'm, like, yeah. very surprised about that. All right. Then we have Perfect Shine of Jax. We all know who hey, that is. Russell, uh, how you doing? Florida's finest. He's coming in here. Then we have, oh, Mario. Mario, he's getting his popcorn ready. You know, that's what we should have. We should have popcorn for this session. You know, for this section of the thing, we yeah. should have popcorn. You know, um, 16, 17 years ago, Richard Lynn and I created the first um, DVD called How to Create a Show Car Finish Using a PC. And that didn't mean personal computer, it meant poor cable. And um, we were working together, and one of the things we were going to do is we were going to come up with uh, our own popcorn line. I forget. Oh, to watch the video with. Oh, there you go. Because it's an hour long. You know, the, that was the first DVD, and I still got a couple copies of it, that showed how to detail a car. We used the 1960 Corvette in tuxedo black, all swirled out, and we used the porter cable. And, but unlike most videos that show a guy doing a little section on the hood, we showed how to do the entire car from start to finish. And uh, that was the first time a video or a DVD was ever made doing that. Everything else before that, and most of what's been done, after that, most, not all, is just. I was going to say we have a couple that we showed the entire thing. Yeah. Um, okay, let's do this. Let's go to this one. Andrew, can we get some more mat classes? I feel like I'm going to be doing more than the kit provided with my Ionic Five, Ionic Five. So I guess doing mat care and. You know, uh, um, I teach uh, one and three day car detailing classes here in Sunny Stewart, Florida. In fact, I got one coming up in May. Um, the thing about teaching the mat class is, and I'm happy to do it, I just got to get a mat car. <laughs> um, a, a couple months ago, uh, there's a local newsletter that goes out, and uh, my friend Jim Sarah puts it out to the local car guys, and I said, hey, could you put a little wanted ad in there? And just wanted, Mike Phillips is looking for mat coated or mat finished cars. Not a single person got a hold of me. They're going to get a free detail, but I could have used that for a class. So, so you know. For, for, I always practice what I call, I take them as I get them. You know, th this comes in, this is what we're using, you know, yeah. so. Okay, let's go over to an Instagram comment. Uh, this is Dr. Detail, or Detail Dr. Florida. My findings are the Flex machine is way smoother machine that clearly feels extremely refined. One thing I'll tell you about this tool, I do not know about this tool, is the gear sets in here, like all the Flex tools, are precision machined stainless steel. Most of the tools on the market use stamped steel. So um, it's a difference in quality, strength, rust, corrosion, and uh, the precisionness. That's why they're smoother, that's why they're quieter. Especially if you grab a tool like the rotary. I mean, uh, Bob Eichelberg showed this to me years ago. He took a DeWalt, set it next to the PE14, and just turned them on low speed and just let them run. And you, this is smooth, quiet. 
you turn a DeWalt on it, it growls. <laughs> and that growl is because the gears are all sloppy in there and they're chattering as they're spinning. So, you know, back to that thing I said at the beginning of the video, you get what you pay for. Okay, uh, let's go to this comment. We got Mario coming back on again. Can that backing plate be switched to a Lake Country 5 inch plate? Um, it looks like they copied it pretty identical, so my guess would be yes. Um, I, I haven't used those smaller backing plates for absolute years, just because, as I showed you, I just, I just, I just make the tool do what I want it to do, thus I don't need to switch to a smaller Bigger backing plate. Bigger is better with Mike. A, yeah. In fact, I really love a, a big pad on a gear-driven tool. And here's, here's a tip for all you people that buy the Sea Beast or the uh, Supa Beast. They come with a 5-inch backing plate. Take it off, throw it away, put the 6-inch on, and here's why. First of all, it makes it smooths out the tool because you got a bigger footprint. When you run a bigger backing plate, you can run a bigger pad. Smooths the tool out. And they have a lot of power. Now you can take advantage of the power. If you're churning and turning and burning a little five and a half inch pad, fine if that's what you like, but the tool is tippy. It's not as smooth, and you're not taking advantage of that gear driven, no slip, no, no pad stalling power. Here, give me a favor. Step that way a little bit. Gotcha. Right there, covering up the plugs. That was annoying me. Sorry. Uh, right, yeah, there you go, stay right there. Uh, Thad coming in here next, test drive the Harbor Freight Hercules 20 volt cordless rotary polisher. I have that back there on the counter. We used it in our last class. It, it performed just fine. So here's the difference between the Flex cordless rotary and the Harbor Freight cordless rotary. It's a price point of about 200 bucks, but the battery life of the flex tools, you'll get more charges, like up to a thousand charges. I don't know what it is for the Harbor Freight. I don't know how many times you can charge it before it dies. Um, it char recharges faster and it'll probably run as, as long or probably a little bit longer. So, you know, it's kind of a toss up, but they both, they both got the job done. In fact, we used it to buff out a 1958 Impala. We used it to buff out a 1941 Chevy after we sanded it and we used it to buff out a 25 foot sea hunt boat after we machine wet and machine dry sanded that boat and it performed just fine but here's the thing and i got this from my friend russell if you go to harbor freight and you buy start getting into the hercules brand of cordless tools buy the eight amp charger they got three one is an eight amp then they have a single four amp and they got a double but the double you think you could get battery charged quicker it's still only a four amp charger so it takes over an hour to charge a battery so by just that single eight amp and maybe someday harbor freight will come out with the dual or a quadruple eight amp charger for people that go through a lot of batteries the other thing though is, is you got to buy a third battery that way you're never done and they're about 100 bucks a pop just like flex okay all right we have corey kaskin name sound familiar uh, glad to see you still doing your thing, Mike. Caston? <laughs> Doesn't ring a bell, but I usually remember people by their cars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it looks like a red and white shoebox, actually, is what it looks like. Cool. Uh, this is the uh, first time I've ever worked on a, on a Del Rey. I've done a ton of Bel Airs and two-door posts and sedans, but this is technically a, a Del Rey. Okay, now we have David coming in here. Is force rotation the same as gear driven? My yes. dual action Makita 18 volt LXT brushless. Well, here's how you can tell. Walk out, grab the tool, and if you can do this, it's free spinning. If, if when you try to do that here, it don't go nowhere. It's because you've got to actually grab it and spin it because it's gear driven. You've got to turn over the gear set and the motor. This one here, you're just turning over the spindle. I think the Makita, the only Makita I know that's gear driven is their rotary. It was funny because like guys always talk about these tools as being um, force rotation. Let me help you guys. This is, this is force rotation. It's a rotary. This is force rotation, forced oscillation. Two words, okay, not just one. But the Makita that I know of that's a gear driven orbital is called the PO5000C. So again, walk out and see your polisher. If it, if it does this, then it's a free spinning tool. If it only spins in a circle, then your Makita is a rotary, not an orbital. Okay, uh, this is a loaded one. Briefly <laughs> talk on it, because um, I think maybe we'll do another live on this stuff. Okay. Uh, would, it, would it not still polish if you had pad stall because it's still orbiting? 
through much less effective, whereas if it's not orbiting, you're not hey, doing any polishing. Hey, so if, if you got that kind of time, go for it. You yeah. know? Maybe we'll do a, yeah, a let, little Let me phrase thing. it this way and listen very carefully. Paint removal, okay, leveling the paint, is going to be most effective if the pad is both rotating and oscillating in a uniform motion, not kind of rotating and then stopping and then starting or just barely doing it. Th look, you want to turn this sucker on the six or any brand, you want to put this down on the paint and you want it to go nuts, okay? You want it to go nuts. You don't want it sitting there doing stuff like this. I'm going to turn it down just so it stalls out. That's not doing anything. It's just, it's not doing anything. It's, so, yeah, you know, do it however you want to. I'll tell you, this is a big car. It takes a long time to buff it out. I want my pad spinning and rotating in an even, uniform rate. All right. Um, I'm going to be the voice from another. I did watch a video, when was it Sunday, um, where this was the whole topic. That's why I was saying that this was kind of oh, getting to be a hot gotcha. topic. Yeah. And they went around to this detail shop, a bunch of detail shop, or a bunch of people in the same detail shop. And asked the question, is it rotating? Is it da da da? All right, so okay. get to the demo part. Yeah. They show the guy when he's just holding the polisher and he's slowly, you know, barely not even pushing anything yeah. and trying to remove sanding marks. So it was 2000 grit sanding marks, okay? okay? And then he takes the same orbital polisher and pushes down on it really, really hard where he stalls it out. So there, right there, was the flaw because when they opened it up, it showed that the holding it hard down, what they call it, actually removed more. But the thing was, is on the other one, he wasn't applying pressure. It was literally the way of the tool. Yeah. So it's like, you have to push on it a little bit. You a little can't bit. just let it yeah. set. Yeah. So that was, a, you know, there's a lot of things that you have to take in consideration. Yeah. So. Some other factors are, you know, the shape of the panel and more importantly, paint hardness and depth of defect. I mean, you can have hard paint with shallow scratches. That'll buff easy. What if you got hard paint with deep scratches? Deep scratches. Okay. So, you know, there's a lot of different combinations, but, you know, in, the, in, the, in a practical real world, um, if you're going to use a free spinning random orbital polisher, I've used them for years. You know, I'm one of the first people to use a porter cable probably. And uh, they work great. And millions of cars have been de have been de swirled using a tool like this. But you really want to make sure that you got pad rotation and oscillation. It should be uniform. If not, to be better couple, effective with your time. Yeah, it's going to be more effective with your time, and you're going to get better results faster. And another key thing about that is, is a lot of times on these smaller tools, you'll get better pad rotation if the pad is actually tuned for the tool, whether it's thicker, thinner, or the size. And and I'm a big fan of switching over to a clean dry pad often because two reasons. One, every time you put a little product on a on the face of pad, any tool, and then put it down, foam's going to do what it does. It's going to absorb some product. Do it again, absorbs product. Do it again, absorbs product. Pretty soon, that pad's full of liquid. It's not going to rotate very good. It's not going to oscillate very and it's good. It's going to work your tool more. Yeah, yeah, and the other thing is, is cutting and polishing pads have a sharpness to them. But when they be, get wet with the product, they all become a finishing pad. So if you're trying to pull out swirls and scratches and your pad is soggy wet, the only thing that's cutting is the abrasive technology. Switch to a dry pad and boom, you'll see the uh, defect removal amp up. Okay, all right. Let's get some of this. We got about 10 minutes left. Okay. All right, we have Kyle coming in. The softest paint I've ever worked on was a 2005 Black Lotus Esprit. It was a B. I put scratches in the paint, just wiping the polish off. That paint I can't remember. Was your brother-in-law's yellow one? Was that one really soft No, paint? Uh, me and Richard Lynn uh, did a uh, Lotus Elise that was orange. And I don't remember if it had soft, uh, soft paint or hard paint. I, I will tell you this. You know, a lot of people like to make generalizations. Audis, all Audis have hard paint. Hondas all have soft paint. Your Dodge has hard paint, so therefore all Dodges have hard paint. But that's not true. Paint changes at the OEM level. One year it could be hard, one year it could be soft. It's wherever they and can save a buck. When I was at McGuire's, I had uh, two Audi station wagons. These were really special station wagons. I never seen them before. Came in the same color, like a sky blue. And the reason the guys, they brought it to my T-Nog, Thursday night open garage. And the reason they brought it there is because they couldn't get the paint to look good because whatever they put on it, they went to wipe it, the towel scratched it. So I showed them a little cheater tick. Use a quality one-step cleaner wax. The wax acts as a lubricant, so when it dries, you're, you have some lubrication as you're wiping off. We got to flawless finish. Okay. Moving on, uh, we have somebody. Come on, show. Show. <laughs> Okay, uh, is that a 55 or a 57? And it's not a Chevy Bel Air. It is a 
Del Rey. It's a 55 Del Rey. In fact, uh, I sent, there's a full write-up for this. Everything has got the, uh, what's the engine? It's got an LSA engine in it, a supercharged engine. Uh, I couldn't rattle off everything there, but I sent uh, Victor the link to where you can go see the full write-up to this. It belongs to a guy named Mike Stowe, and some of you may recognize the brand, but he started and then later on sold a company called uh, Classic Instruments. So a lot of street rod builders chip. Oh, through now I know people. why he's connected with all those people. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, he built all the instruments for all the cool car builders out there. Okay, let's get through. All oh, his there cars we go. Cool he's got the picture up on there right now. Thank okay. you, Victor, for Thanks, bringing Victor. that up. Uh, all right. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, Mario, you should need you ask what speed is he using for those eight passes? Six. If it went to seven, it'd go seven. He's like the uh, what was that show? Turn it to 11. That was called Spinal Tap. Spinal Tap, yeah. yeah. He's a Spinal Tap polisher. I, I will tell you this. After I got done finishing out with the first step uh, with NSP 150, I did switch over to the Supa Beast because it's lighter, quieter, cooler, smoother. And I stuck on a, a softer a finishing pad and repolished the entire car with NSP 45. The roof is actually already ceramic coated. The rest of it I have to knock out. Okay, we got Grant coming in here. Great timing today, guys, using the Rupes Millet. Yeah, you the have Millet. to say it, Millet, like the that. The Millet. Um, <laughs> uh, on a 66 F100 custom cab show street truck. Oh, nice. be sure to post that. I'd love to see that. Yeah, so the Millet is um, a gear-driven orbital polisher that Rupes introduced a few years ago. And it's a five millimeter. So same kind of uh, idea, but a little tighter orbit stroke. Uh, once you get down to like three millimeter, I mean, you're talking a rotary, but it's a very, it's a much tighter orbit pattern. Um, I don't see people talk about them much. I used to teach a, a Millet class when I worked at the Geek. You know, I had everybody using a Millet and, uh, and I let people make up their own mind. Use yep. the tool, figure it out for yourself. Okay, we got Kirby coming in here. Afternoon, Mike. Always a good day when you're working on a custom classic. Yes. Okay, we got Grant. I uh, have a question. All right, this is Grant. How many pads did you, do you go through on what, and what sort of speeds do you run on gear-driven tools, melee, flex, etc.? Um, you know, some of that's going to be personal preference. For me, you, you got to understand my mindset. I want to go as fast as I can so I can get done. I don't want to go just go fast just to go fast. I want to get done. This is a huge car. It takes a long time to go from machine scrubbing the tires like I did on this, cleaning the wheels, washing the car, claying the car. I did a, a water just wash on this with prep wash. Then I clayed all the paint and then, you know, then doing the test spot. Then once you're down on the test spot, starting on the roof, working your way down. I mean, it, it takes hours to do this. So why would I want to do it in any way that takes longer? I don't. So I want to, I bump the polishers up to six, you know. And um, I used to change pads a lot more often before I came to Dr. Beasley's. But if you saw my little um, tip there, uh, I showed with a tire cleaning brush. Um, their pads aren't really wet, full of a lot of solvents and liquids. So they don't really saturate the pad, but you do get a buildup of paint as you're abrading the surface. So I just like to take and clean the pad. But I probably went through like four or five pads for the initial step. And then I think I used two for the polishing step. So much less when using Dr. Beasley's product. Other people's products, look, as soon as that pad gets wet, it's saturated, you really gotta switch to a dry pad. And I would not recommend washing it and then putting it back to work because it's still wet. Even if you put on a rotary sling the water out, throughout the entire foam pad, it's wet with moisture. And it's gonna get even wetter faster as you start putting product on it, putting down the paint, and it starts going into the pad. So just have a nice collection of pads. The other thing about using more pads and changing pads often, is the pads will last longer, you have more life out of them. Because keep in mind, no matter what tool you're using, that ossing action is a violent action. And you're adding time and pressure and heat and chemicals. I mean, everything's working against the foam, the adhesive and the Velcro. So switching pads often helps your pads last longer over the life of the span of the pad. Okay, uh, we have Barry coming in here. Does Dr. Beasley have a jeweling or finishing polish? I already have the PS. 45. Yeah, they have a product called, I think it's Liquid Ebony. I gotta be honest, I've never tried it. Um, I've been told it's even less aggressive than 45, so that'd be something you'd wanna use on any delicate surfaces. Um, uh, but you know, I've had a good look with 45. So down here in our live classes, we did a 1969 GTO single stage urethane, very soft paint, and that plexiglass back window, that plastic soft, and NSP 45 finished out flawless on both, and it's finishing flawless on this black paint here. 
Okay, this is gonna be like a two-parter. He kind of has a couple questions in a row. So quickly, we have like four minutes left, so let's try to get through these. Okay. Daniel, uh, I'm sure the HF gear-driven will get the job done, but it can't be as good as the smooth as the flex. I'm curious how long it can use the HF before it starts vibrating the life out of your wrist and hands. Then he comes back. Also, I forgot to ask about the weight compared to each. A, and uh, 3401 back in 2015, but sold it after almost a year of use. Pretty good, but I guess it was more to me than 301. I got the Ru Rupes Millet, and to be honest, I don't care much for it. May get another 3401 this year. So are they about the same weight? Yeah, they're about the same weight. I, I, you, couldn't, you couldn't go, well, I'm gonna use this one because it weighs so much less than that one. It's really not, it's just not a deal breaker at all. Okay, now when you talk about the vibration, I don't remember if you ever did talk about the vibration. I, I personally, but you see the problem with me is like, I meet a lot of guys that say they have a hard time buffing out cars because now their, their, their nerves and everything's getting tired after years of buffing. That's never happened to me. Nothing seems to affect me. Um, so I don't notice that. If I was more sensitive to it, I'd notice it. Um, I will tell you this, when I come out to buff out cars, even though I have this, I do tend to grab the 3401. It's just, you know, just it's a habit, I guess. I don't know, I just grab it and go. Okay, uh, two more. One's just a statement, one's an actual comment. So we'll, I mean a question. So we'll start with this one. Okay. Uh, Daniel coming in, I remember that video, you and Richard Lynn, made that video. I must have watched it 10 times or more. I loved that video, learned a lot from it, and that has helped me <laughs> a great deal. Unfortunately, let a buddy borrow it, and I never. And when I got it back, all I could, I could not watch it anymore. Dang gone. Yeah, I got three copies of it. I also have a copy of the rotary video that me and Richard Lynn created, how to use a rotary, that never went to market. Oh, all right. Last one coming in here. We have the Tundra Whisper, and I love your, your little thing. He's got a boxer, it looks like. Is a rule, is the rule of thumb fast for removal or and slow for jewel? Fast for removal and Oh, slow. fast for paint de defect removal and slow for jeweling. Uh, yeah, I would say so. You know, when you're, when you're, it depends. Usually when people talk about jeweling, they're talking about using a rotary polisher. And so um, when I use a rotary for a heavy paint correction, I'm not using it at the highest speed. On, on, the, on the PE 150, the cordless flex rotary, I go to the three, which is like 1100 RPM and maybe up to the four. Uh, so I'm not all the way up to six. I'm not going to 21 or 2200 RPM to buff out clear coats. You're not bump bumping it all the way up? No, not okay, on the rotary. Okay, that camera over there. Oh, okay, <laughs> not on rotary. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, but if you wanted to be one of those people that can jewel paint with a foam pad and stop after that, then I would say it takes a couple, uh, three, four things. It takes amazing abrasive technology to start Check with. Check one. It takes like a gold, super soft finishing super pad. Makeup soft. Foam, gotta be foam. Uh, it takes great technique, okay? You gotta really know how to run that polisher. And then you also need paint that is what I call polishable. You know, some paint is more polishable than other polish than other paints, and so you need all four of those things kind of working for you. Yeah, well, that's kind of like a perfect storm, though. But, but the most important is the very simple technology. You know, I, I meet guys all the time that want to argue that, you know, my technique is so good, this tool's the best, but if you think about it, what's touching the paint? Not you. <laughs> the abrasive technology. It is yeah, the Yeah, it's what is literally in between It's everything. literally touching the paint. Everything else is secondary. <laughs> so. All right, so with that being said, I would like to take a moment to thank each and every one of you for all yeah. your comments, your questions, your everything that you posted in this little side of the window, actually this little side of the window. <laughs> um, and also if you have any ideas for videos that you would like this guy to put into motion, put it in the comments, shoot him an email, shoot him a phone call, whatever. And like always, we'll be back next Wednesday. Yeah, next Wednesday. Um, on. Do we have a topic? I have not got a topic. Stay tuned for that. <laughs> uh, and then what we're going to be doing, he is going to finish this up and I got to get over there. Then we got to shoot some B-roll for some other upcoming videos that are not live. They're like Memorex. They're articles. They're videos. Art. Yeah. So thank you all for tuning in and I will let him have the out while I walk back over this one. Uh, real quick, um, we got a five day class coming up in Chicago and that's uh, April 8th through the 12th. The first two days are, um, 
uh, rod crafting myself, teaching paint correction, dry sanding, wet sanding by hand, by machine. It's, we got a really cool car. It's an AC Cobra and a 60 Impala for you to train on. And you can get signed up for that at drbeasley.com. The next three days, I'd have to just, I got to look at my notes over here. We got dry ice cleaning. We got leather repair. We got rock chip repair. We got PPF and window tinning. We got growing a money making YouTube with Jason Otterness. We got search engine and money making websites with Chris Dia Giovanni. We got mobile detailing rigs with Tony Ralda. We got uh, a lot. Flex Power Tools with Chris Metcalf, Lake Country with Bob Myers. We got creating a multi million dollar empire with Britt Winfield. And we got chemistry cushions with our very own Dr. Beasley's, Jim Lefebvre. Uh, anyway, it's going to be an intense five days. I'll be up there for the first four, but uh, you get more information up at drbeasley's.com. And then coming up the first week into May, I've got my big three day class here, and that's where you get to learn. All the, all the topics of paint correction, light paint correction, extreme paint correction, ceramic cleaning is the first day. Second day, I bring in the coolest cars. We go over dry sanding by hand, dry sanding by machine, how to use rotary polishers. And the third day, I bring in the worst condition boats and we machine wet sand them, machine dry sand them, use rotaries, orbitals, and put gel coat ceramic coatings on. So the three most popular topics and the three most profitable topics in a single weekend. So a single set of airline tickets, hotel, rental car, blah, blah, blah. Anyway. Okay, and for those of you that are interested in the Future of Detailing Pro Clinic, Victor did put the link in the comments so you can go there. If you seen this and you don't feel like going there, go over to Dr. Beezus. I'm sure they have it on their website over there. So with that being said, we are out. Mike, what do you say? Hey, thanks for turning in and watching. These are always a lot of fun. All right, say bye. <laughs>